Family Theater presents Lucille Ball and Dean Miller. From Hollywood, the Mutual Network in cooperation with Family Theater presents Last One in Line, starring Dean Miller. And now, here is your hostess, Lucille Ball. Family Theater's only purpose is to bring to everyone's attention a practice that must become an important part of our lives if we are to win peace for ourselves, peace for our families, and peace for the world. Family Theater urges you to pray. Pray together as a family. And now to our transcribed drama, Last One in Line, starring Dean Miller as Moffat. <laughs> As a matter of fact, the compartment I had on the train wasn't too bad. Of course, I got a little tired of being locked in at every stop. <laughs> Oh, how'd that one get in here? Let me tell you about the That is Arlen Mutt. He just might turn out to be this year's favorite comedian. And if he's lucky, he might even stay on top of the heap for a couple of years, long enough to make a stake. Last month at this time, he didn't have a chance. Last month at this time, he was on his way back to burlesque just as sure as I'm standing here. That's too noisy in here. Let's go on out on the fire escape, and I'll tell you more about Arlen Mutt. This seems to be the year and the season for stories about the funny men of the entertainment business, expose-type stories. Saw Hal March in one a few weeks ago. Did a great job. Nice, tight story. Then Mickey Rooney did a bang-up job on another one. Fine characterizations, both of them. But the comedians, the stories were about, both had big psychological problems. This story is about a comedian with a problem. It's true. And we promise it's the last one of the season. I want to tell you this one because Arlen Mott's problem was the one that almost cost him his big chance at the big time. Arlen Mutt's problem was different. I first met Arlen about a year ago when he came into the office I had on Sunset Boulevard. It was a little second floor, 12 by 12, on the inexpensive side of Laurel Canyon. It wasn't much, but then a talent agent doesn't spend much time in his office anyway. In fact, it was just luck that Arlen found me in. At the time, I figured it was his luck, not mine. Look, I'm trying to be honest with you. You want that, don't you? Yes, of course, but I still need an agent. But I don't handle comics, never have. So, th there's always a first time. Yeah. Can you give me one good reason why there should be? Hard enough getting work for an unknown, even if he's a strong dramatic actor, but a comic... Uh, well, well, I'm not completely unknown. Have you done any pictures? Well, uh... Film, television? How about live television? Well, maybe if I could... Uh, Radio? Well, just because I have... Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Maybe you better tell me just exactly what you have done. Or maybe I can tell you. Let me see now. High school plays. Mr. Mom. They thought you were a very funny man on campus. None of that. All right, then. You tell me. Well, I've, uh, I've done a lot of nightclub work. Okay. How'd you start? Now, give it to me straight. Well, uh, I sang a little. I, I started with a show in the old Waterburn Theater on Detroit Street. Show was called Mid Century Review. May, may, maybe you heard about it. Mm -hmm. yeah, go on. Well, the show went on the road, but that didn't take me long, so I stayed with the theater. It went burlesque right after that. They needed a tenor, and I doubled as a comic, and pretty soon I was the featured comic. Mm -hmm. Along with 30 beautiful girls, count them, 30. All right, but I was the comic. Well, as, as soon as I could swing it, I cut out, started working the clubs. Yeah, steady? Well, so far, only on weekends, but I'm good, Mr. Moffat. I'm sorry. Just come down to see me work. Once, that's all. I, just once. Look, if you were an actor, I... But I'm not, and I figure a guy should do what he does best, don't you? If he can do it and keep eating, yes. Well, I think he should, even if he can't keep eating. Look, just come down and catch my routine. I pack them in. They come just to see me. Come down just once. Then, well, if you still say no, I'll, I'll let you alone, okay? It won't do any good. But, uh, you come... All right, all right. Where are you working? Well, 
Well, I didn't want to, but I went down to watch him work the following Saturday night. It was at a little hole-in-the-gutter-type place on East 61st. <laughs> it was called Basil's Cave, and the floor show consisted of two people. A middle-aged woman who could play a piano and an electric organ at the same time, and our boy, Arlen Mott. The lady with the keyboards was not so pretty good, but Arlen, well, he looked like he might turn out to be a pretty fair country comedian. Well, at least most of the people laughed in the right places. As soon as he was finished, he headed right for me. Hello, Mr. Mott. You been here long? Well, I heard your routine, if that's what you mean. Uh, how'd you like it? I liked it better when Joe Frisco did it ten years ago. Mm. Look, I don't, I don't suppose you've got a dressing room, some place where we could talk. Well, there's the alley. I thought I was in it. Pardon me? Come on, lead the way. Uh, right through this door. Now, uh, about me using Frisco's and Doesn't care. matter to me. I just hope he doesn't find out about it. Aside from that? Aside from that, well, I think you might be able to make a buck or two if you keep at it for a few years. Will, will you take me? Will you be my agent? Hey, you've got a job. You call this a job? Two, maybe three nights a week if I'm lucky, and for that I average about 25 bucks a week? You mean you're living on that? Well, I, I got another job in the daytime, parking cars on the other side of town. Yeah, come on. But I'm tired parking cars to make ends meet, and I'm tired of working in dumps like this and having the manager act like he's doing me a big favor when he pays me. I'm tired of having to use other people's material, too. I'm telling you, Mr. Moffat... You out there, Mott? Uh, yes, sir. Now, who's this? Uh, Hank Baylor, the owner. Better get in here. You'll be on before long. Well, suppose you come out here. Oh, easy, easy. It's not much, but this job, man. Who are you? Name's Don Moffat. Hmm, a talent agent? That's right. Oh, yeah. I saw you inside a few minutes ago, didn't I? Well, no, I'm not the one to tell you what you saw, but I was inside a few minutes ago. I came over to watch your comic. Or maybe I should say my comic. You're representing this guy? As of now, I am. That's absolutely right. And I'm afraid I can't let him work for you anymore, Mr. Whatever your name is. It's Baylor. What do you mean you can't let him work for me? Can't do it. Well, we've got a deal. I'm sorry, but you've got to look at it our way. Suppose he got out that he's working here for tips. Tips? I pay him. Look, you've got him around for the weekends. He does what? How many shows a night? Four. Five. Sometimes six. You're paying him tips, brother. Well, it might be a little low, but he doesn't bring in a whole lot of business. Look, I've seen your dump. I know how many drop-in customers you can expect to have here. Now, look, let's be reasonable about this. All right, we'll be reasonable. Forty a night, three nights a week. But we can't give you any more than a four-week contract, not at these prices anyway. Mr. Moffat, look. Forty a night, three nights a week? I, I can't. Why, I'd have to be nuts to go for a thing like that. I'm a small operator. Mm -hmm. And it looks like you're going to stay that way. Mott brings in business, or you wouldn't have kept him here in the first place. That... Well, unless there's a holiday, there's no sense in having a show three nights a week. All right, two nights a week then, but on that arrangement, it'll have to be for 50 per. Now, wait a minute, I gotta think about this. Hey, take all the time you want. You might like your place better as a nice, quiet little club anyway. Uh, get yourself a shuffleboard table, a TV set. What are you talking about? I was doing all right before Mott ever came along. Yeah, sure you were. You got anything to pack, Arlen? Now, now wait, now wait. All right, look. Two nights and 45 is the best I can do. But it's gotta be an eight-week deal. Well, I don't know. I, I don't think we can do it. Uh, I think we can, can't we? Look, I was only thinking of letting him stay on here because he's going to have a new act to break in pretty soon. Uh, look, Arlen, maybe Vegas would be the best place to break the act. Okay, okay, 50 a night. But it's got to be an eight-week deal. Eight weeks? Your place doesn't... Well, look, your place doesn't do much for the boy. There's no publicity. I'll put his picture out front. Big deal. I'll put him in my newspaper ad. Featured? All right, featured. Well... Arlen, how do you feel about it? Well, I think so. I mean, yeah, let's take it. Okay, it's a deal, then. Well, I'm probably making a big mistake, but all right, providing you arrange for a dressing room. Dressing That's room? That's what I said. All right, all right. That's it? That's it. I'll send you a contract over in the morning. Man, what a shakedown. Now, wait a minute. You haven't signed it yet. If you still think it's a shakedown in the morning, just send a thing back. Snow skin off our nose. Nice meeting you, Mr. Baylor. Yeah. Come on, Mott, you got another show to do. He'll be along in a minute. Don't make it too long. Oh, you just about scared me to death. <laughs> you got a complaint? No, no, complaint. A hundred bucks a week? Uh, I usually don't work that way. Usually more kid glove stuff than boxing glove, but, well, a creep like that would let you work here for nothing. Yeah, but if he doesn't sign... He'll sign. Mr. Moffat, I, I don't know how to thank you. You don't have to, Arlen. All you have to do is send me ten bucks a week for the next eight weeks. Well, I better be 
They're getting home now. Oh, incidentally, I want you to be in my office tomorrow morning at 10. You understand? You want me to sign a contract? Well, we'll, we'll be around to that later in the week. Tomorrow I've got something else in mind. You just be there. Yes, sir. I'll be there. Oh, and I think there's something else we ought to get straight right now, Arlen. What's that? Taking you for a client has to be worth more to me than 10 bucks a week. If I'm going to make any money on you, it'll be because I'll be getting 10% of a lot more money than you're worth right now. Oh, I understand that, Mr. Yeah. Moffat. Well, understand this, too. When it comes to say so, I'm the 90%, not the 10. You do what I tell you, and you and I are both going to make a buck. See you in the morning, Arlen. Yeah? Mr. Moffat, there's a Mr. Arlen Mott here to see you. Huh? Is Bill Casson here yet? Well, there's somebody coming up the stairs now. It could be Mr. Casson. Okay, honey. When he gets here, let him right in, will you? Mm-hmm. Oh, you can send Mott in now, too. Yes, sir. Hello, Mr. Moffat. Oh, come on in, Arlen. Well, come on, come on, take a seat. Thank you. Arlen, there's a guy coming over here who's just about the top man in his field. He's, he's... Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hi, Don. Oh, here he is now. Come on in, Bill. Bill, this is the boy I called you about. Arlen Mott, Bill Casson. How do you do? Hi. I've heard your name before, haven't I? I'd be surprised if you hadn't. Bill writes some, <laughs> he writes some pretty funny stuff. Oh, of course. Bill Casson, you're a gag writer. Just the writer, if you don't mind. Sorry. It's okay. It's a mistake everybody makes. Arlen, Bill's going to write you some special material. What's he been using? Other people's. Oh. And Don, what exactly did you have in mind? Uh, a nightclub routine. A club routine? Yeah, well, I know it's a little out of your line, and that's the reason I called you. You see, we want something that's different. Now, it's got to be playable in front of a club, but I want it kept clean. I don't figure our boy here is going to be spending too much time in those sewers from now on. Are you thinking television? That's about the size of it. A TV show? Sure. Sound all right to you? Fine, fine, fine. Say, I've got some ideas about a routine that might really be great. Oh, that's fine. That's just great. What's the matter? Well, look, I'll let you two work that out. There's one thing I want to understand, though, Arlen. You know what you can do, and you know what you can't do. Now, if you want to discuss that together, fine with me. But Casson is getting paid for writing your stuff because he's a professional. You follow me? Uh, he won't tell any if I don't try to write any? <laughs> That's about the size of it. Yeah, but about this paying, I, I don't have any money. Well, I do. Let's just consider this in the nature of a loan. I don't get paid till you've had a good chance to try the material anyway. By that time, you'll be able to afford it. You got it? That's the way it works. Bev. Yes, sir? You can come in now. Yes, sir? Did you make that dental appointment all right? Yes, sir. And the others, too. They're all set up. Okay. Oh, by the way, Miss White, this is our newest client here, Mr. Mott. How do you do? How do you do? Well, uh, Mr. Moffat, if you have a dental appointment, I guess you'll be wanting me to come back some other time. No, 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 no. I don't have a dental appointment. You do. Me? That's right. Look, honey, will you see that all of his front ones are put in good shape, but no caps unless it's absolutely necessary. Those, those things are just too darn expensive. Mm-hmm. Bill, you free today? Pretty much so. Is something you want me to do? Well, if you're going to know what to write for our boy, you two ought to spend a little time together. Might as well kill two birds with one stone. Thought maybe you could help Bev pick a couple of suits for the boy. Glad to. You've no objections. Me? Oh, no, no. Great with me. Fine. Well, I guess you three ought to get going, huh? Mr. Moffat, I think you'd better be on your way, too. Hmm? You've got an appointment at 20th at 11. Wait a minute, that's right, I almost forgot. 20th? The studio? No, 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 it's not about you. You know, I've got other clients, too. I will tell you one thing, though, Mr. Mott. I'm investing a little money in you, and I figure to get it back inside of six months. Six months? That's right. After that, it won't be long before you'll be paying for my dental work and buying my suits. With Casson writing for you, I'll get you your own show inside of a year, or my name's not Don Moffat. Well, from then on, things went along pretty much as I'd hoped. As a matter of fact, they went on better than I'd hoped. After his eight weeks at the cave, breaking in the patter Bill had written for him, I got him into a real nice place uptown. He packed him in, too. After that, it was easy getting bookings for him, and it was easy to build him with publicity. Ah, look at that, will you, Don? Did you read what they said about me? That's the best review yet. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. A fresh kind of comedy. We're betting on big things for young mutt. Good, huh? 
Oh, it's great, but I'd like to remind you that that kind of stuff is written for the public at large, not for you to commit to memory. The 5% you pay a press agent just might have a little something to do with stories like that. You know what I mean? No, no. This is written from the heart. You can see it. Yeah, from the heart, huh? You know, Don, I've been thinking about that 5%. Oh? Uh -huh. Yeah, it seems like a lot to pay a guy when you never see him do anything. You see the results, don't you? I don't know. I'm not so sure we need him. Arlen, after a train gets rolling, it's all right to take one of the drive wheels off the locomotive? Oh, brother, you'd make a great engineer. Well, no. Look, you got a lot to learn, but you're not going to learn it at my expense. We keep the press agent. After about five months around town, I got him a shot at one of the big hotels in Vegas, where he, well, he also knocked him dead up there, too. And at the prices he was getting, it almost broke my heart to call him back. But the way things stacked up, I thought it would be... Well, it'd be for the best. We met in my office, the three of us, Arlen, Cassin, and I. You know what? We found Arlen a little changed. Ah, uh, don't see why you keep it. Look at the place. Dim light, noisy traffic from the boulevard. It's a hole in the wall. You ought to have a big plush office on La Cienega. Something with a little class. You can afford it now. Hey, 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 hey. This suits me just fine. I've always liked this office. You would. All right, come on, let's get down to cases. Yeah, I got your telegram. Say, Cassin, I, I heard one in Vegas. You got to work into my monologue. This kid, you see his kid, he's got a seat by the window. He looks outside and he sees some kids playing and he looks at his father and he says, Daddy, why can't I go out and play like other kids? And his father says, shut up, kid, and deal. <laughs> Don, are you sure you want this guy on television? Hey, what's the matter with you? You know, you're the glummiest gag writer I ever saw. How about this guy, Don? Ever see him smile? Don, I don't think he's going to last 39 weeks. This punk's so filled up with himself, he'll explode before that. Punk! I'm your bread and butter. All right, that's enough, both of you. Cut it out. We've got some business to discuss. You heard what he called Take me. Take it up with him some other time. Right now, we're going to talk business. Well, let's get it over with, then. I've got a date. A date? Yeah, I'm taking your secretary out to lunch. This gives us just one hour. Oh, well, I think we can do a little better than that. Beverly. Yes, Mr. Moffat? Take the rest of the day off. Go on home. Well, thank you, Mr. Moffat, but I... Uh, Mr. Mott will be a little too busy to have lunch today. He'll honor you with his company some other time, perhaps tomorrow. Well, all right. Just who do you think you are? He's only the guy who pulled you from $25 a week to $3,000. Okay, gentlemen. We have a commercial, weekly, half-hour television commitment to talk about. Shall we get to it? <laughs> Things went all right for a while. Maybe it was a little rough, but at least we got through the first two or three shows. And then it happened. Just the way Bill Casson said it would. Arlen Mott got so filled up with himself, he exploded. That camera just doesn't move in fast enough. How many times do I have to tell you? Believe me, it looks fine. Fine. The whole gag will fall flat on its face. That's how fine it'll look. You on the camera, try once more. You've been like this all day? Directing him is like trying to... Well, it's like nothing I've ever done. I've just about had it with your boy. He's been giving you a real hard time, huh? Not only me. That's the first violin directing the orchestra. The conductor? He couldn't take any more. He walked out. I'm about to. Well, we're going to try the shot again. No. It'll play fine the way it is. Look, so far today, just about everything on the show has been half-baked. The script, the score. Now the direction. Well, it's got to stop someplace. That's all. Where are you going? I'm going home. Money just isn't so important to me that I have to take that from him. Now, wait a second. Let him go. I can drag any guy in from the street and see a better job of direction than he's been showing me. Try it, Mr. Mott. Or try directing it yourself. Maybe you can get everybody to quit. You're dead in this town. The next buck you make will be from selling your hoof for a glue. Bum. What are you trying to do? Protect myself. That's what I'm trying to do. When a man's got a name, he's got to protect it. Yeah, well, you're doing a great job of protection. What do you know about it? You've never been in front of a live audience in your life. You don't know what it's like to earn a living anymore. Well, that does it. Goodbye, Arlen. Where are you going? Somewhere where the air's a little cleaner. Wait. You got something to say? You're not cutting out on me, too. That's exactly what I'm doing. Oh, come on in the dressing room. Let's talk this thing Tell out. you what. 
You go into the dressing room and think it out. You're throwing away 10% of a pretty hot item. Yeah, well, I'll go home now and have myself a good cry. Don? Goodbye, Arlen. Mr. Moffat? Oh, I bet. I forgot you were here. I, um, couldn't help hearing what just went on. Yeah, well, we've got a lot of other clients, Bev. Aren't you even going to talk to him? No, there's no point in it. You think I should? I think so. Look, there... There isn't anything between you two, is there? No. I thought there was for a while, but now the only thing I feel for him is pity. Pity? He's got a problem. Problem? You mean in his head he's got a problem? Maybe because his father punished him when he was a little kid. Uh, something like that. There's nothing wrong with him that a good Peruvian witch doctor couldn't cure just by shrinking his head back to normal. Well, that's what I mean, Mr. Moffat. Maybe you shouldn't have hit the big time quite so fast. Well, you've got some of the responsibility, too. You helped give him the problem. You ought to help him solve it. You think I should, huh? You're the only one who can. I've heard you cut some other people back down to size. Oh, look, you've got to try. Can't you see fame to him is like sudden wealth is to most people? It could destroy him. Mm. Okay, Bev. Okay. Hey, uh, wait for me, will you? Maybe I'll buy you a cup of coffee and let you know how the whole thing turned out. Good luck. Thanks, honey. Hey, punk. Still in there? That you, Don? Yeah, it's me. Uh, I hope you'd come back. Got wise to how much cutting out would cost you, huh? No, I came back to tell you that you're going to do some phoning. You're going to call up all the people who walked out on you today, and you're going to tell them just exactly how sorry you are. Oh, I am, am I? That's right. You're going to tell them you're thoroughly ashamed of yourself for getting a swelled head and acting like a kid. And then you're going to do everything you can to make them come back. Hmm. You better wipe that smile off your face, or I'll knock those caps I paid for right off your teeth. Love, Don. After you get your people back, you're going to go and see Bill Casson, and you're going to tell him you realize how you'd still be a bum using other comedians' jokes in some upholstered sewer if it weren't for the great stuff he writes for you. But... Uh, and then you're going to tell him how you appreciate the fact that you'd be just about as funny as McCarthy without Bergen if it weren't for him. After Casson, you're going to call your press agent. You know what you're going to tell him? Mm. You're going to tell him he's so good you actually believe the publicity he got for you. Now, now, Don, wait a minute. Oh, no, I haven't even started yet. You and I, well, we're going to have a little history lesson about some of the other comics who got real big-headed with their television shows. You know what I'm going to do? Hmm. I'm going to tell you where they're parking cars and where they're washing dishes. And then after that, Arlen, Mr. Big Shot, you and I are going to have a talk about you. Well, like I said, this seems to be the season for stories about comedians. I suppose that's why I'm telling you this one now. Arlen's problem... Well, it was a problem most people have to face at least once in their lifetime. It's got a lot of names. Swelled head, vainglory, pride. But no matter what you call it, it's a tough one to whip. I help Arlen beat the thing every week. It's based on a custom invented by the Romans. When a general returned from a successful campaign and made his triumphal entry into Rome, riding his chariot right through the cheering crowds, there'd be a slave squatting in the front of the chariot, out of sight. He'd keep saying the same thing over and over. Remember, thou art only human. We use the same method, only I guess a little bit more so. Well, the show ought to be just about over by now. I guess we better get back inside, huh? Couldn't have been better, a funnier show yet. <laughs> now, you see what I mean? I have to go neutralize all that. Hey, yeah, couldn't have done it without you, you know. Hey, Don, wait. See you later, Don. Yeah. Oh, Bill, I want to see you. Don, catch the show? I couldn't stay for the whole thing, but from what I saw, I hope you're saving your money. That bad? I'm glad I've got other clients. I don't know, Arlen. Script was good, everything was good, but your delivery, it needs a lot of work. I, I, c come on in the dressing room and tell me about it. In a minute. Right. Uh, I'll be getting this makeup off. See what I mean? Crazy, but it works. He's turned into a real nice guy. Well, back to work. 
Who are you talking to? Never mind. Let's talk about the way you butchered Bill Casson's script. Edda Hopper whips up a new hat. She takes a couple of everyday, ordinary things, like a tomato or a green apple, mixes it with a bunch of ribbon, and lo and behold, it's suddenly something that would do justice to John Fredericks or Lily Dashay. Lots of husbands have seen their wives do the same thing. And then, too, you read every now and then how some scientist mixes a concoction of ordinary things, a sort of cocktail made of waste products. And out of his magic test tube comes some application never heard of before. Jewels out of sawdust, perfume out of coal tar, medicine out of weeds or mold. You never realize the beauty and the value of things until you experiment, until you try them. That's pretty much the same way about prayer. Have you noticed lately how in the field of medicine, the psychologist and the psychiatrist have been rediscovering the value of prayer? But prayer has been there all the time, just for everyone's taking. It's ironic to think that persons will accept prayer on the basis of an up-to-the-minute medical authority when for as long as they can remember, religious authorities have told them the same thing. Yes, prayer is one of the forces of life itself, but you've got to use it to get its benefits. The jewel of a happy home life, the perfume of uplifted hearts, medicine for a sick world. Use prayer for your family life. For the family that prays together, stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. From Hollywood, Family Theater has brought you transcribed Last One in Line, starring Dean Miller. Lucille Ball was your hostess. Others in our cast were Bill Bauckham, Alice Backus, Jack Carroll, and Jason Johnson. The script was written and directed for Family Theater by Robert Hugh O'Sullivan, with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman. This series of Family Theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who feel the need for this type of program, by the mutual network which has responded to this need and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who give so unselfishly of their time and talent to appear on our family theater stage. To them and to you, our humble thanks. This is Tony Lafrano expressing the wish of family theater that the blessings of God may be upon you and your home and inviting you to join us next week when family theater will present... Retired, starring Edgar Buchanan, Jack Bailey will be your host. Join us, won't you? Family Theater is broadcast throughout the world and originates in the Hollywood studios of the world's largest network. This is Mutual, the radio network for all America.